There's no denying the opening cinematic for The Taken King was awesome. The Awoken launch a full-scale assault on the Dreadnought, only to be vastly overpowered by Oryx and his super weapon. Here's the concept art by Jesse Van Dyke of that sky battle. It helped establish the setting, the Hive Saturn rings, and the aftermath of battle in one shot. Here's some art by Frank Capizzuto exploring the design of the lesser battleships from Oryx's fleet, the pieces they could be made up of, and what it might look like for one to be destroyed. Speaking of the super weapon, what exactly is it? Well, the Grimoire explains that when Oryx uses his sword, he calls on the power of the darkness to push his throne world out into mere reality. Only a tiny egg-sized amount, although it swells up like a ghost star and explodes to create the colossal shockwave. So what is the throne world that I just mentioned? Well, it's actually one of Oryx's ascendant realms. Other examples are Crota's ascendant realm in the Hellmouth, known as Crota's End, and Hive ships also rip into our physical world from these ascendant realms throughout the game. Here it is in the Books of Sorrow. You are dead, young Oryx. Your body is gone, but you have endured, safe in the Cyst universe created by your own might your throne world. From this day forward, Oryx, you and your sisters will each survive death, so long as you aren't killed in your own throne. So it's kind of like Voldemort's Horcruxes from Harry Potter. Here's what Oryx himself has to say about it in the final entry of the Books of Sorrow, Worm Food. I have died many times, but these deaths were only temporary. If my echoes are killed, and I am killed in the material world, then I will be driven back to my throne, the Dreadnought. If my court and my throne can be beaten, if I'm defeated in my throne, then I will die. So what is the Dreadnought? Who made it and why? Well, here's the backstory according to the Grimoire. One of Oryx's sisters said to the other, Listen, Zivu, Oryx's throne world has been compromised. You can cut your way in from here. But Oryx was too canny and said, My throne world is vulnerable. I'm gonna move it into a mighty dreadnought. I shall keep my glorious mind cosmos inside a titanic warship. When Oryx had built his dreadnought, he pushed his throne world inside out so that it bled into the material space of the dreadnought. The dreadnought was within the throne of Oryx, but the throne of Oryx was the dreadnought. Now Oryx's throne was safe from incursion because it moved so nimbly. So Oryx himself built the dreadnought and then moved his throne world inside so that it wasn't vulnerable to attack. Okay, so the Dreadnought houses Oryx's throne world, and he can't truly be defeated unless he's killed there. Don't we do that in the final mission, Regicide? Well, here's what the Taken King story does a poor job of explaining. The throne world is inside the Dreadnought, but the entrance to the throne world is the court of Oryx. Again from the Grimoire, If my echoes, my court, and my throne can be beaten, then I will die. We finally confront Oryx at his altar in the physical realm in the Mission Regicide. Oryx then takes himself, as confirmed by Deej and the Ride Along, then flees one last time to his actual throne world deep inside the Dreadnought. This sets us up for the King's Fall Raid. We enter the throne world through the Court of Oryx, and then finally we confront the literal Taken King at his throne in the final game space known simply as Threshold. A postcard describes an entire destination with a single image. This shot is supposed to capture the atmosphere, mood, palette, architecture, materials and visual language of the Dreadnought. This was the initial inspiration for the ship when development first began. Speaking of the materials, when the team was exploring surface materials the Hive might use, they drew inspiration from shark teeth, bone in enamel, and crystalline onyx, as well as fungal and barnacle growth for the walls. Basically anything that indicated the Dreadnought was older than time. They wanted accumulation and layering to be a tangible component of the environment. And one example of this is the structural elements intruding in on the old cave-like spaces. This concept art explored the architectural language which was very gothic inspired, spiny, bony and skeletal in nature. And then finally, the shape language of the hive architecture with the slanted ceilings, the grit and webbing on the walls with torn cloth thrown in, etc.
This activity was the establishing shot for the Dreadnought player experience. It has all the major elements that are repeated throughout the ship. A foreboding and dangerous fortress filled with secrets that offers endless opportunities for exploration. This first area is a large open space with minimal cover. It's meant to make you feel exposed, isolated and small. They also intentionally left out enemies so you could get acquainted with the environment and feel free to explore. There's also no waypoint initially in the first mission, so that players had room to navigate by sight as opposed to an arrow. And the lighting team aided this by designing really strong light coming out of this hallway to just naturally lead players in that direction. However, to avoid frustration, user research recommended that an arrow appear after about 30 seconds of gameplay. This is early concept art of what the Court of Oryx was going to look like. For a long time, they stuck with having crystal obelisks as the player interactable to summon champions. But because the crystals are so common around the Dreadnought, they felt they wouldn't stand out enough. The redesign led to the statues instead, which have one clear purpose. The obelisks did get used eventually, however, in the final encounter with Oryx. Here's the concept art exploring the aforementioned statues. Now there's also Hive and Taken across the Dreadnought that drop sigils. These are basically a way for the lesser Hive and Taken to communicate with high ranking Hive. So when a player acquires one, they're actually opening a portal into Oryx's throne realm. This concept art by Jesse Van Dyke is the Cabal ship from the mission on Phobos. It contains the Bond brothers as they ploughed their ship into the Dreadnought. This shot captures the chaos that ensued right after they crashed. But by the time us Guardians arrive in-game, the fires have smouldered, although they're still smoking. It's a rubble-strewn battlefield. The team intentionally bent all the pillars in the same direction to really sell the impact and crash landing of the ship. This transition space running alongside the ship used to be a series of hallways, but the public space team felt there was just too many of the same, and asked the art team what else they could come up with. So they opted to continue the hull of the ship along the space. This maintained the feeling of being outside, it has strong visual storytelling, and helps orient the player as they move into the next zone. This next concept art is the view of the front of the ship. When building this space, the team had to imagine what it might have looked like before the crash landing. To do that, they created a sequence of architectural elements, and then they break that sequence where the ship impacted. As an example, here there are pillars that have been knocked over suggesting what might have been. The founts are full of prison cells that have been there for millennia. Within the cells are enemies of the hive that were captured. Here's concept art of what the cells might look like. In game, they're embedded in the walls and hanging from the ceiling, and the coverings on some of the cells are also destructible. And here we have the main prison cell room. When you arrive in game, if you look up, there's actually a sentient being known internally as the Warden that patrols back and forth. The giant drill-like structure in the center is actually a torture device. If you look closely, there are prison cell doors just visible being rotated. No doubt unspeakable pain is being relentlessly administered to the ill-fated within. The team wanted a grand, impressive door for the entrance to Oryx's outer chambers. And this was the concept art by Darren Bacon to explain the macro shapes of the wall, to really sell Oryx's majesty. Through the doors is a double boss fight, and Luke Smith wanted to almost trick the player, in a sense, into thinking this was the final Oryx showdown, but instead Oryx just sends his henchmen, as he still doesn't think you're worthy of his time. During development, the devs referred to the bosses as Bebop and Rocksteady, who were two fictional characters from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon series. The entrance to Oryx's inner chamber is supposed to be very ominous and foreboding. To achieve this effect, the enemies actually retract in the doors as you approach instead of fighting you. And the waterfalls themselves flow upwards towards the entrance. Overall, it's an invitation from Oryx into the King's Chambers. The bridge doesn't have to be scanned or built, and Oryx rolls out the red carpet, so to speak, as he illuminates your path towards the altar. Destiny's Cosmodrome. It's based off the real-life Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, 
if it had progressed 30 to 40 years into the Golden Age.